Bom dia, então, para mim é um prazer apresentar a Matilde, que é a nossa última palestrante da Semana Temática de Sistemas Dinâmicos. A Matilde Martínez, ela fez graduação na Universidade de la República, no Uruguai, e fez o doutorado no México, no CIMAT, e ela atualmente é professora também na Universidade de la República, no Uruguai, então a gente é um convidado internacional. Muito obrigada, Matilde, por aceitar o convite. E ela vai falar hoje sobre quase isometric classes of lips of minimal foliage. Seja bem-vinda, Matilde. Obrigada, obrigada. I have to apologize because I'll be speaking in English because my Portuguese is non-existent. Sorry. Well, but I thank the organizers for the invitation. I'm really pleased to be speaking here. <clears throat> so I'll be speaking about quasi-isometric classes of leaves of minimum foliations. So this is taken from, from joint work with Fernando Alcalde Cuesta and Álvaro Lozano Rojo, both from Spain, <clears throat> and from a paper which has actually been already published, it was published in 2021, called Free Minimal Actions of Solvable Groups Which Are Not Affable. So the reason the title has uh, very different words from the title on the talk is that when we wrote this paper, we were focusing on something uh, different. So the, this paper presents an example, but when we wrote the paper, uh, it, we felt that it was very important that it was an example of one thing. And now I'm speaking about this same example as the example of something else. And the reason I'm doing it this is that I'm now in my work kind of refocusing on this other aspect of I, I'm trying, I'm doing some follow up work related to the aspect of this example I'll be speaking about today. So if anyone is curious and finds some of these words attractive, I'll just say one slide. This was originally meant to be an example of the following thing of if you have a counter set, it was an example of a relationship, equivalence relationship of this on this counter set together with a measure class such that the relationship was amenable with respect to this measure class, but which didn't come from a continuous action of the group C. So it didn't come from a continuous discrete dynamical system. And for some reason that is explained in the paper, we were interested in this. So that's not what I'll be speaking about today at all. So today I'll be speaking about something else. So I'll be speaking about uh, something which is related to geometric group theory. So, uh, as some of you may know, geometric group theory is group theory, so the study of groups, but with the tools from geometry and from probability theory and from dynamics. So, what we usually do is we take a group and we associate to it some geometric space and we studied this geometric space and we relate the properties of this space to the algebraic properties of the group. Or alternatively, we see the group acting by some minimal geometric transformations on some spaces and try to understand the group via its action on some spaces with some geometry. So if you have a group which is finitely generated and you have a finite symmetric set of generators, so this symmetric means, oh, sorry, means that if S belongs to S, so thus it's inverse. Uh, you can associate to it what we call the Cayley graph. 
So this is a graph. So during this talk, we will always be focusing on groups which are infinite for I mean, for what I'm speaking about, the the case of finite group is 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 not interesting. So, if you have this group and the set of generators, you can associate a graph defined in the following way. So, you have uh, the vertex set is G, and you put an edge in the graph whenever you can go from one element to G to the other one, multiplying by a set by an element of the generating set S. So this gives you a graph, okay? And when the group is infinite, the Cayley graph is infinite, it's connect the Cayley graph is always connected, it's always locally finite because the set S is finite. In fact, the degree of every vertex is the number of elements of the set S. And the Cayley graph is also what is called vertex transitive. So it's a graph that looks very much like itself everywhere. And this means that the uh, uh, graph is vertex transitive if the group of automorphisms of the graph acts transitively on vertices. So, so it's a graph that looks like itself, looks the same absolutely everywhere. But in fact, not all infinite connected locally finite and vertex transitive graphs are Cayley graphs of a finitely generated group. So a question which is relevant is which graphs are Cayley graphs? So when we are studying this geometric object, which is the Cayley graph of a group, how is this different from studying graph theory in general? So on which kind of graphs are we focusing? So, uh, I mean, for a long time, uh, people have known of examples of graphs which are very, which which are like this and are not Cayley graphs. Okay, it's not very difficult to give an example. Now, one of the problems with <coughs> with the Cayley graph, when you want to use it to understand the group, is that the Cayley graph depends on the generating set you've chosen. So, if you have the same group G with two generating sets, S and S prime, the two corresponding Cayley graphs are very different, are different, okay? But they're not, not so different if you look at their large-scale geometry. So, large-scale geometry means that if you look at it from afar, they look vaguely the same. And this is a concept that is captured and this notion of being quasi-isometric. So the definition is following. We say that two metric spaces, these two metric spaces are quasi-isometric if there is a function between them, which is a quasi-isometry. This means that it satisfies this condition, which if you don't look at this constant, if this constant were, were not there, this additive constant, this would be saying that the function f is bilipchit. So the function f is kind of bilipchit. It's bilipchit up to a bounded error. And also, this says that the image of the function is almost dense, is C dense in the space x prime. So it's like it's almost up to a bounded error. This is a surjective function. So this is the notion of quasi-isometry and it's the type of equivalence you consider when you're studying large-scale geometry of spaces. 
And even if the Cayley graph does depend on the generating set you choose, two Cayley graphs for the same group are always quasi-isometric. And two spaces which are quasi-isometric share many geometric and analytic properties, okay? So this question goes back to the 80s and it is following. Are there vertex transitive graphs which are not quasi-isometric to Cayley graphs? So uh, a, a graph which is vertex transitive can be quasi-isometric to one which is not. But the question is, are there vertex transitive graphs, that is graphs that look the same in every vertex, which are at large scale very different from Cayley graphs. So this question took quite a while. So in 2001, Distel and Leader uh, constructed, they had constructed an example and they conjectured that this example was not quasi-isometric to a Cayley graph. So this is an example of a connected infinite locally finite vertex transitive graph which was conjectured in 2001 not to be quasi-isometric to a Cayley graph. And finally, in 2012, Eskin Fish and White effectively proved that the distal leader graph was not quasi-isometric to a Cayley graph. And in fact, uh, their argument shows that some other spaces, such as some Lie groups, were also not quasi-isometric to Cayley graphs of finitely generated groups. Uh, so there's a sim so uh, when we're trying to 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 know what spaces are quasi-isometric to Cayley graphs or what are the quasi-isometric classes of Cayley graphs, graphs, there's a similar question by Gilbert Hector, which was the following. If you have a compact metrisable space, with, for example, manifold, it need not be a manifold, with a minimal foliation, so this is a foliation for which all the leaves are dense, Thus, the minimality of, so, sorry, if you, you're in this setting, uh, you can put a Riemannian metric on the leaves, which varies continuously in the space, and this means that the leaves are metric spaces, and the metric structure does depend on the metric, but when the space is compact, the quasi-isometric class of the leaves does not. So it, the, it makes sense to speak about the quasi-isometric class of the leaves. So the quasi-isometric class of the leaves does, does not depend on anything, on any additional structure. And the fact that the leaves are dense, so the recurrence of the leaves, means that leaves are kind of self-similar at large scale. So, so they are also spaces that at the, that broadly look alike everywhere. So the question by Hector was, are the leaves of a foliation quasi-isometric to Kelly graph? So is this other kind of space, which is very much a self-similar thing, quasi-isometric to a Kelly graph? So Hector was, uh, pondering this question while he was trying to understand uh, some kind of equivalence between pseudo-group actions, which are the kind of transverse dynamics of evaluation, and group actions, okay? The answer to this question is positive when the generic leaf of evaluation has two ends. This is due to results by, uh, this is a consequence of results by ETNGs and Emmanuel Bloch. And uh, leaves of affoliation 
generically have one end, two ends of a counter or a counter set of ends. And the same is true of Cayley graphs. A Cayley graph always has one end, two ends or a counter set of ends. So for the two end case, uh, it is true that if you have a minimal foliation where the leaves have two ends, they are quasi isometric to Cayley graphs. So uh, what I'll be speaking about is um, an example of a foliation whose leaves are simply connected, but they are not quasi isometric to Cayley graphs. So in general, the answer to Hector's question is negative. Okay. And this is an example uh, which will be built in the space of tilings. So I'll say what the space of tilings is. So if you have a floor in your home and you can tile it, tiling your floor means exactly what is in the picture. So at the left here, you can see a tiling of floor with squares. And here, you can see Sir Roger Penrose standing on what is called a Penrose tiling. So what is a tiling when you cover the floor with tiles? What mathematical properties does it have? So first of all, a tiling of the floor involves a finite set of tiles. So you can have different tiles, so here you have squares of different sizes and here you have things which are different, but you have only finitely many uh, shapes of tiles to tile your floor with. Then there are no overlaps, so you put one tile next to the other but not onto the other. And these are the two main features of a tiling. You cover the floor with finitely many tiles in a way in which there are no overlaps. So you say your tiling is periodic if you have a repetitive tile, a repeating pattern. So here the example in the left is repetitive, is periodic tiling. You have a pattern which repeats itself. In, in the floor, an infinite floor, which would be R2, this would mean that there are two linearly independent translations that leave the tiling invariant. And the tiling on the right is not periodic. That's exactly the one of the main features of what we call a Penrose tiling. So you don't have a compact patch which just repeats itself. So it is periodic when it has a repeating pattern and it's aperiodic when no translation leaves it invariant. So aperiodic is not the opposite of periodic. In fact, for instance, if in R2 you, you can have a tiling which has is invariant by one translation, but not by two linearly independent translation. And that would be a tiling which is neither periodic nor aperiodic, okay? A tiling is repetitive when it's not periodic, but it very much looks like itself everywhere. So that's also a significant feature of Penrose tilings. And the mathematical way to say this is that for any radius r, there is a bigger radius r prime such that in any ball of radius r prime you can find any ball of radius r mm -hmm. so any finite even if the tiling is not periodic every finite uh, piece or every compact uh, piece can be found everywhere and it can be found with an uniform frequency. So, and then uh, you may want to ask that the tiling is face to face. This means that you um, glue the face of one tile with the face of another one. 
So for instance, here the tiling on the left is not face to face because for instance, this face of this big square is not exactly glued to this face of the small square. So this one is not face to face and this one on the right is face to face because the face of one tile is glued to the face of another one. But in any case here, there is some condition on how the, the tiles are glued. You know? So it's not just anything. So you, you want to put some condition on how you glue the faces, okay? So this idea that you have a finite set of tiles with no overlap, you, you cover your space with a finite set of tiles with no overlaps or gaps, and with some condition on how the faces touch. And this notion that the tiling is periodic or aperiodic or repetitive makes sense in the floor R2, but also on any league group G. So you can define what the tiling is on any league group with the translations in the group used to say whether the thing is periodic or repetitive or whatever, okay? So what is this, if we have some league group, what is the space of tilings? It's a space where each element is a tiling on the group with a marked point. And this space is endowed with the gromov hausdorff topology, which is the following. If you have two tilings, tau and tau prime, with, with their respective mark points O and O prime, you say that they are close if big balls centered at the marked point are close. So big balls centered at the marked point differ by an isometry close to the identity. So that's for what it means for, for two tilings to be close. And the in this space of tiling, the group G itself acts by translations because if you have a tiling on the group g with a mark, marked point you get another tiling by simply translated translating the the point the marked point and the whole structure mm -hmm. so uh in the space of tiling you have an action of the lead group g and the continuous hull of a tiling is the closure of its orbit. So, as a summary, so far we have a metric space, which is the space of tilings with a marked point on some Lie group G with the Gromov house of topology. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we have an action of the Lie group G on this space. And there are different orbits. And the structure of an orbit depends on the property of the tiling. For example, if the tiling is periodic, this is equivalent to its orbit being compact. And we can do this for any Lie group. So when the tiling is aperiodic, which means that it's not left invariant by any translation, but it's repetitive, which means that it very much looks like everywhere. This means that the orbit doesn't close, but it has a lot of recurrence. So in this case, the closure of the orbit, the continuous hull, has a structure of a foliation, which is locally some open set on the group. And times a cancer set. So the leaves of these foliations are isometric to G and homeomorphic and everything because since uh, if the tiling is aperiodic it has no symmetries so so there are no stabilizers for this action and all the leaves are dense this comes from the repetitiveness of the tiling. 
So if you manage to have a tiling which is repetitive and aperiodic, you'll have some compact min foliated space for which the foliation is minimal and the leaves are like the group G you started with. Okay, so this is the way in which we will build our example. So let us choose a lead group conveniently. So we, we wish to construct an example of a minimal foliation for which the leaves are not quasi-isometric to Cayley graphs. So uh, we have to choose the group appropriately. So this is a, this is a group which was uh, considered by asking Fisher and White in which is the following. If you have two real numbers, positive real numbers A and B, the group so AB is this semi-direct product defined like this, or simply put, you can see it as a subgroup of the three by three matrices, which is this thing I've written here. Okay? So, uh, if you multiply two of these matrices, you can see that this is in fact a group. So, w what is it like? If you take A equal to B, you get a very uh, well-known Lie group, which is the group Sol. This is a three-dimensional solvable Lie group, which is the following. So the group Sol has a following uh, thing, feature, let's say. This is a left invariant metric on Sol, and you can see it in this way. So this two by two submetrics which I've uh, drawn in yellow is like a hyperbolic plane. This is isometric, isometric to a hyperbolic plane. And the blue one is also isometric to a hyperbolic plane. So the group saw is topologically it's R3 and metrically it's foliated by two transverse families of hyperbolic planes but the thing is one of them is looking like upwards and the other one is looking like downwards another way to say this is that if you look at this white line and you take the flow which is going like this vertically this is an anosov flow where these guys are the stable manifolds of this flow and these yellow guys are the unstable manifolds of this flow. So when you go upwards, this is R3 with vertical lines, and when you go upwards, these blue lines are exponentially contracted, and the yellow lines are exponentially expanded when you go upwards. Okay? So this is the geometry of Sol. So what is Sol AB? When A is different from B, you get something which is very, very similar, except that now the group has some A and B parameters here. And these two families of hyperbolic planes are still there, but the rates of contraction and expansion of the blue and yellow lines are now different. So you still have a left invariant metric for which you have a yellow and a blue family of hyperbolic plane, but now the it's like the when you go upwards like this, the rate of construction of the blue of these blue lines is different from the rate of construction, the rate of contraction of this yellow line when you go downwards. But it's almost the same thing. So it's a group which is very similar to, to the group Sol. One difference, for example, is that uh, this going upwards thing is not volume preserving, for instance, okay? So uh, we're 
during a construction which is uh, similar to and inspired by a paper by Samuel Petit, who did something on the real fine group. The real fine group is the um, is a, the group of linear fine transformations of the line, but this group. So AB has uh, an interesting feature, feature which the affine group doesn't have, which is the following. It was proved by Eskin, Fisher, and White. They proved that the, if A is different from B, this so AB group is not quasi-isometric to a Cayley graph. And this is what makes it interesting for us, okay? So, let the 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 purpose of 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 this is now I have a Lie group which is not quasi isometric to a Cayley graph. I will use this space of tilings in this Lie group to construct a minimal foliation in a compact space where the leaves are like this group, so they are not quasi isometric to Cayley graphs. Okay. So how do I construct this? This example, I need to build a tiling on this group, so AB, which is not, which is aperiodic and repetitive. So, I will start by this tiling of the hyperbolic plane. This tiling is due to Penrose. So, this construction by Penrose is as follows. Uh, there is only one tile P, so in fact all these shapes are isometric in the hyperbolic plane. So then what he does is, first he um, applies this translation, so he moves the original tile P to the left and to the right, and he has a line of tiles. And then he applies this translation and he moves this line upwards and downwards. And he gets this tiling. So you absolutely have to do it in this order. So first you apply S and then you apply R to the whole line. And this gives a tiling of the hyperbolic plane. This tiling is not periodic because in fact its only symmetry is this S translation here. But it's also not aperiodic because it does have a symmetry. So this, this S can be seen as a translation in the affine group. And it's a symmetry of this. Oh, no, sorry, 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 sorry. This R thing is a symmetry. Sorry. S is not a symmetry because, for instance, this one, if you, if you translate it one to the, to the left, this would be one. So if this is n, this is n plus one. If you translate it one, this won't go to the same tiling, but this R is a symmetry of this tiling. So it's not periodic. It's not aperiodic because it has a cyclic symmetry group. But we can color the tiling to break this symmetry in a way which makes it aperiodic and recurrent. So there are several ways to do this. So uh, this is a tiling which is neither, which is aperiodic and recurrent in the hyperbolic plane. And the hyperbolic plane is in fact isometric to the affine group with its left invariant metric. So this can be seen as a repetitive and apparatus tiling of some Lie group, which is the affine group, okay? But this Lie group is not the one we're interested in because this group is quasi-isometric to Cayley graph. This group is isometric to the hyperbolic plane, which is quasi-isometric, for example, to the fundamental group of any of any fo co compact function group, so the fundamental group of a
compact hyperboxers. So, 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 so far we have a tiling in the hyperbolic plane. But now remember that this group soul, AB, is some three-dimensional Lie group that is foliated by two transverse families of hyperbolic planes. So what we're going to do is, we're going to take one of these planes and we're going to draw this tiling we have on the hyperbolic plane. And now we have to fatten it in some way that will give a tiling on the whole group. So uh, we, we draw this uh, aperiodic repetitive tiling on one yellow plane. So when I say yellow and blue, I'm referring to, to this stru structure of, of uh, transfer yellow and blue hyperbolic planes in the group. So I draw, I, I, I draw the tiling on some yellow plane and now I'm going to fatten it along the blue direction. So uh, the group is R3, but with this metric, it has two families of hyperbolic planes, which are transverse. So um, I had to use translations in the group to, to work with that, which is because I've defined the space of tilings and being periodic and aperiodic in terms of translations in the group. So uh, this transformation is this translation in the group. And I choose the initial tile P, which was the, the initial tile in the Penrose construction, and I fatten it with this translation. So now it has thickness one. And now this tile, I'm going to push it around. So I'm going to push around this initial tile along three directions in a very specific order, just as in the case of the hyperbolic plane, in order to get the tiling of this group. So I push it around by this translation by this element, and then two similar things. So I push it in. So I know if you remember how we did in the hyperbolic plane, but I push it first time in the yellow plane. So I push it by a translation in the yellow plane, which is R, and then this whole line by S, and then by the one that thickens it. And for an appropriate choice, uh, we get this, and this is a tiling, for some appropriate choice of the parameters a and b so uh, the theorem is uh, this is a tiling so this is always for all a and b this is um, this covers the space and with no overlaps but if additionally you you add a condition on the on the quotient between A and B, it is face-to-face -face and repetitive. So with an appropriate coloring, you can also make it aperiodic, okay? So it's something like, like this. The picture is something like this. So, so now, um, We have one tiling, and when we take this tiling with a marked point, and we see it as an element of the space of tilings, and the group acts there, it has an orbit, and the closure of this orbit, which is a continuous hull, is compact. Mm -hmm. So MAB will be this, the closure, of the orbit of this particular tiling under the action by translation of the group saw AB. So, as a summary, what we have is, we have a metric space. We've chosen our group now. The group is saw AB. For this group, we have this metric space, which is 
the space of tilings on this group with the Gromov house of topology. We have an action of the group soul AB on this space. We've constructed a particular element of this space, which is a tiling, which is both aperiodic and recurrent. And now its orbit closure will be compact and will be endowed with a foliation, which is minimal. So for the appropriate for appropriate for an appropriate choice of parameters, the this orbit closure is a non-empty compact metrosol space that has a free and minimal action of sol A B. So it has a foliation coming from this Lie group action, which is a lamination which is transverse Lecanter. So this is a a foliation in a space which is locally uh, an open set in this group SOAB, so it's locally a three ball times a counter set. And the leaves of this foliation are uh, SOAB symmetrically, so they are not quasi isometric to Cayley graphs. So this means that the the answer, in, in general, say to Hector's question, uh, where was this? So this is the question by Hector. The answer in general is negative. So it's true for foliations which have leaves with two ends. It's false in general. And this example is for a foliation which has leaves with one end because these leaves are, 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 th are three topologically. And the question is still open for foliations whose leaves have a cancer set of ends, which happens to be the case where, for, on which uh, Hector was most interested. And I'm trying to work on that. That's why I've chosen to speak about it. That, that's my motivation to speak about this today. So, um, uh, so that, that uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Obrigado, Matilde. Então, a gente vamos abrir o espaço para perguntas, comentários. O Eu fiquei um pouco curiosa, porque você falou, eu vou falar em português, aí você responde por em inglês, não tem problema. E, e sobre a, esse canto, né, você fala que a... Você pode colocar o enunciado novamente, no final? Ah, sim. É, é uma eliminação que é atravessar um canto, né? Aí, é, esse canto, você sabe alguma coisa sobre... Como é a dimensão de Haldor? Alguma, tem alguma intuição? Nada, né? Não. Não, não. Nada, nada. Hum, Ou seja, quero... uhum. é compacto, perfeito, totalmente desconexo. Isso. <risos> <risos> Aí não dá para saber se é gordo ou não, né? Eso es lo que sé probar con las propiedades de la dinámica. Uh -huh. Interesante. Eh, yo hace muy legal ese eh, vínculo entre una teoría de Lina y, y la dinámica. Es eh, bien interesante. O, si tuviese que sugerir una, una, algún archivo, literatura para quien se quise iniciar en esa área. Que você sugeri. <risos> I, I don't know because I I don't even know what the area is. So, <risos> tem, tem, so tem muita coisa por trás, né? I come from foliation theory. So I studied in the Alcides and Camacho's book, like everyone. 
so uh, the the book is um, Cesar Camacho and Alcides eh, Neto ¿no? eh, es teoría geométrica de foliaciones that's the book and I've studied there and I started in foliation theory and uh, then I studied geometric structures on foliations I moved a little bit to liquid theory but I've never actually studied geometric group theory so geometric group theory is is very close to foliations because foliations are actions of pseudo groups and then I've worked with people in in geometric group theory and so on uh, but I don't have kind of a reference book so um, a very nice book which has many things uh, as always if you understand some uh, very very significant particular cases you understand a lot so there's the book by Andres Navas if someone's interested in geometric group theory when he, where he studies uh, groups acting on the circle. Mm -hmm. So it's a group of, of homomorphisms of the circle. And I find that this book has, is a great reference for anyone interested in seeing how uh, the algebraic properties of groups translate into geometric and dynamical both topological and ergodic theoretical uh, properties of actions. But so, so those are the two books which are, which have been important for me, let's say. Right. Obrigada, Matilde. Hugo, você quer fazer uma pergunta? Era uma pergunta é, mais baseada, então, nessa direção. Eu vou falar inglês também, pode ser? Uh, it was a question more uh, based on what you're talking in the beginning of the talk, like uh, when you're introducing the topic, you said that the, there were some list of four properties that Cayley groups uh, would have, uh, mm -hmm. like they were vertex transitive, uh, sorry, I, I forgot the others. And you yes, said that, finite and so on. Yes. Yes, yes. And you said that there are some examples of metric spaces that have these properties, but they're not Cayley uh, groups, I believe. Uh, can you some point? Graphs, the, huh? Some graphs that have these properties, but which are not Cayley graphs. Yes. 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 Cayley graphs. Exactly. Yeah. Um, can you point to some examples of? There's a famous example which has been known for a long time, which is called the grandmother <laughs> graph. Okay. I, I don't quite remember the construction, but you start with a tree with, with, this, um, with this tree. So each uh, vertex has this one of constant degree three and then you do some um, you take a part like this and you do some you draw some little figure in these places I don't remember which one it is and you get a graph which is quite um, which has no it has been known for a long time which is not a Cayley graph so uh, this I learned from a talk I first heard of, and it's very nicely drawn in a talk by by Wolf. When you can look for the PDF, it's some some slides and and stuff. So I think that it's not something which is in a paper. It's something that it's like it's people know it. Mm -hmm. So I learned it in a from slides from a talk, and but then this example is quasi isometric to a Cayley graph. So this is a, 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 a graph okay. that is vertical transitive. It, it's not a Cayley graph, but it is quasi isometric. Okay. So the one which is not quasi isometric, but it is 
more difficult, the, the construction is more difficult. It's this digital leader graph. I don't remember. And this can be found in the paper by Eskin, Fisher, and White, White which is in the, no, 2012, it's in the Annals of Math, and it's called uh, something like spaces which are not quasi-isometric to Cayley graphs. It has a very, very straightforward title, and it's also available on archive. And this is the, the one which is not quasi-isometric to a graph. So it also has a construction, but it's a bit more, it, it's more difficult. Okay. But it, okay. This one is also vertex transitive. So this is my experience with this subject, but maybe it's just my ignorance, but it's a subject where the, there's a lot of folklore. So if you talk to people who know, they know stuff. And so there are many relevant examples and so on that haven't been written down completely. I see. But the names to look for here uh, for the early stages of this are Wois and Gromov. They've done many, most of the relevant stuff. Thank you. No, thank you. Well, and I suggest we also thank the organizers of this week, who instead of being on holiday have been working very hard, but to but it was very successful, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.